Hi, everybody. Welcome to another installment of the Bitcoin Bottom Line. I'm CJ Wilson, joined by co-host Josh Olswich, uh, Bitcoin veteran. Uh, Josh, yeah. Josh and I have been talking a little bit on the pre-show about all the moving pieces of the current market, which uh, we're in the we're back in the 30s, 30,000 range, which is kind of exciting for a lot of people. Um, you know, all these all these investor guys were like talking smack on us. They're like, oh, you're down so far from all time highs. But this year we're back. I'm wearing uh, green, CJ. I'm green. wearing green. I'm the, yeah. like, you're the octopus. I'm the chameleon. Yeah. Bitcoin is acting like an anti centralized, you know, uh, what is it? Oh, I hesitate to say, to say vaccine. But <laughs> no, it's a, well, it's definitely non correlated, right? We can yeah. agree to that yeah. now. We've, we sort of, and I think, I think Bitcoin, you know, maximalists or Bitcoin people have always looked at it to say, hey, listen, once we break free from the sort of tech tether, you know, that, oh, it's just like trading like some sort of equity, that that, that non correlation is actually better for Bitcoin. Um, you know, and I think that's that's the that's the the initial part of the cycle. We're in the first sort of couple months of that, really, where it's I, I think definitely trading differently than than a uh, than a tech stock or some some other sort of uh, we'll call it like a risk on you know cash investment in that regard. Yeah, because the narrative makes sense. It matches why it was built in the first place, which was to be free of the constraints of everything that most people hold dear and know and love, uh, mm. because it's not beholden to anybody. You know, it's completely outside the system. So to just treat it as some like high beta tech stock or, you know, some leveraged NASDAQ, whatever, mm -hmm. makes sense based on who's trading it. But when there's different people, you know, there's been a lot of like crypto native people getting back in because they've had issues with banking and all sorts of other stuff going on in the real world. But uh, that's certainly helping fuel this this rally. Yeah, the, the, the favorite thing for me is when someone comes on Twitter and they say, oh, there's no real use case. Now we can literally point to Silicon Valley Bank or some of these other things that have become insolvent because of bank runs or whatever very quickly. Uh, Peter Schiff had a bank and it got nuked because he had apparently liquidity issues or some sort of ratio issues. And he wasn't in the bankers boys club, so he didn't get a bailout. He got told to close down. Right. Um, and the funny thing is, right, he's obviously one of the biggest counter signals for us, along with Jim Cramer, um, and says stuff like, oh, I would sell into this Bitcoin rally because this it's not sustainable. That's when Bitcoin was like 23, 24 a couple of weeks ago. And uh, now Bitcoin's like 30, 29, 30, 31, you know, in that kind of range. Um, but I, yeah, I just think it's I think it's funny because the public now it's in front of them. Inflation. Well, at least in the U.S. Because yeah. yeah, before like we always had to point to you know Ukraine or Turkey or Venezuela or Argentina or yeah. or Africa, right? But all of a sudden, the investors that we're talking to, the people we're talking to directly, you know, your friends and family, are very much aware of the need for a twenty four seven payment system. Like that's mm -hmm. it, perfect, right? Call it insurance, call it whatever you want. When it's there, you need it. You don't have to onboard. It's frictionless. What else, yeah. you know, to, to me and you, that's utility. But to other people, they want to see like, okay, can I take it to Barnes and Noble and buy a book? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, that's not what this is about, right? So you and I, but I think to traditional, like the mindset, right? Like how many merchants are accepting it or like, is it mm -hmm. on XYZ app? Right. Um, like to them, like that's, that's what payments means. Like, no, no, no. We're here for the whole kit and caboodle, you know, the whole We're stack top down. Right. And that's the that's that's what my favorite thing about Bitcoin is it's, it's all things. It's not just one thing. It's not just payments. Right. It's censorship resistance. And I think a lot of people saw that for the first time. Western people saw that for the first time ever when Trudeau blocked a bunch of money going to the uh, truckers in Canada through the GoFundMe thing. Right. So right. Gof GoFundMe effectively deplatforms millions of dollars worth of donations. And then you have people like Tucker Carlson go, well, if you were using Bitcoin, perhaps things would be different, you know? And, and so then there's like an awakening. It starts, you know, it's just like a, like a big old bear in the morning wakes up and it's like stretching out. So that was like the first, you know, kind of exhale. So like waking up in the morning was the trucker protest. Then you have the farmer protest in uh, the Netherlands where people are upset at the government because they're trying to tax like, you know, dairy farming and beef farming and stuff like that. And you know, they see it, how that works. 
and how they stand up for themselves. And then there's an election and a bunch of the farmers win seats in the election. So I would say that's the sort of the, the, the total balance of power from like repressing the truth and the people that were trying to hold the truth down, that, that that's kind of like, oh, that's that table's turning a little bit. And now Bitcoin's one of the menu items, you know, for the, for the people to see that of that awakening. And um, I think over the last couple of years through, you know, the, the COVID stuff, the rollouts of vaccine passports and things like that, the Bitcoiners have always been anti these things in, in terms of like anti-freedom and, 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 you know, censorship and the stuff that we feel like the government is, has always wanted to do. And now they're actually attempting it. Um, so not to get too deep in the conspiracy side of things, but like, you know, like cutting through the BS and just getting to a, a, a fundamental truth is one of the things the Bitcoiners love to do. Uh, and the best example of that in the public eye right now was the New York Times article, right? So now the most recent thing is New York Times, this big celebrated, you know, uh, democracy dies in the darkness or the truth dies in the darkness or something like that, right? I think it was, uh, it's was it been less and less celebrated over the years by both right. sides. Right. But, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and not, not in a political way at all, but just saying like, Hey, if, if there's a truth and then, you know, this, this apparently is the decade of gaslighting, right? So everyone's gaslighting everybody, you know, <laughs> and without getting political, like I said, it, just saying that, Hey, there is a truth and the truth is not really up for debate. So when people put this f stuff out there, like it's totally factual and there's no counterpoint possible, you know, a, a, like a one-way trip to, to, you know, Opinionville. So the New York Times publishes an article about a facility and they doctor the video and they say, oh, this facility is like, you know, bad for the environment and using all this electricity and that's creating all the CO2. And there's like people on Twitter that go, you know what? Something doesn't look right about this. We're going to go ahead and check the fork, check like the, the weather forecast for like the last year and see when they could have possibly filmed this. And we're going to, determine if this is actually real because it just looks super hazy and sketchy and we don't think that's what this place really looks like so uh level 39 who's an account that i follow on on twitter goes through this whole thread and it's like oh you know they shifted the they shifted the colors they made like the the color curve on the graph on the histograph um all messed up histogram and just so for people to understand this it's basically it's a it's a total hit piece that's it and this is further proof that not only did they write this article without interviewing the, the head of ERCOT or publishing what he said about any of this stuff, but they also say that, hey, um, you know, Bitcoin's bad for the environment. It's leading to all this CO2 stuff. And this Bitcoin facility, which is pretty close to the power plant, I guess, uh, it's like all smoky and hazy. And they basically photoshopped in some crappy weather around it to make it look gloomier and more, you know, I guess Tim Burton or something like that. So it's just, it's just funny. And people are all over it, like all over it. Uh, Bitcoin people on Twitter are so galvanized to stand up for themselves to stand up for Bitcoin. When somebody lies blatantly, they just, they can't help it. They're like, no, I, I'm not gonna stand for this. Like, I know I'm a pleb. I have a hundred followers, but screw this New York times. You're wrong. And um, it's just, I love to see it. It's great. Well, part of our problem is that we call it a mine in the first place. Um, you know, like calling a wallet a wallet. Like some of them are like pseudonyms or whatever for things just don't mm -hmm. make sense like in the real world. Uh, so like mines, at least to me, have like a dirty negative connotation, right? So like we're already starting on like the back foot by calling it a mine um, mm -hmm. because people assume like, you know, it's hazardous to your health, causes pollution looking at what they tried to do <laughs> you're, yeah. you're going after the wrong crowd here trying to pull a fast one because they will they will analyze everything and mm. figure out what the hell's going on here and that's exactly what they did and uh yeah it's no surprise that people are going after the new york times for this but i'd love to see what the original pictures were like back to back like a side to side. right and and that's what people are saying they're like hey publish the raw photo or the video, the, right? Or the raw video yeah. and prove to us that you're you're not gaslighting us, right? <laughs> so, um, which is like asking a murderer, hey, show us the, show us your knives in your house to make sure that they don't have any human DNA on them, right? That's kind <laughs> of, it's like we've already established that they've probably done this, you know what I mean? And we can put them in, in Twitter jail as a result, in, you know, as a community. 
Um, but I think that's where that's where like this whole this weaponized gaslighting thing, which we're seeing in a lot of different topics. It doesn't matter what side of the spectrum you're on. You shouldn't like it. You should just look at it and say, hey, listen, if you're telling lies, it's it's not we're, we're not going to censor you. We're just going to we're just going to smash you. We're going to dunk on you. We're going to bully you and all that stuff. It is what it is, right? You're lying about us. If someone called you all the names in the book and insinuated that you were some kind of bad person, at that point, they've crossed the line and you have every right to defend yourself. That's the way I look at it. Because there is no CEO of Bitcoin, there's no like centralized council of pragmatic uh, politicians or whatever. Like we're all decentralized. Like, so it's all just like the piling on effect of everybody just like taking it, you know? What was really funny though is they got. I mean, you know, millions of impressions effectively, right? This article gets millions of impressions. So Pierre uh, from BPI, um, he puts he puts on his little like Tommy the Miner hard hat and his high vis vest. He walks out in the field like behind the thing and like all this scrub weeds or whatever. And he's like, oh, I have a CO2 monitor and da 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 da. And then you have people like PC Gamer going like, is this really how dumb Bitcoiners are? And it's like, did you really fall for this? You know, but Pierre's video last time I checked had like 5 million hits, like 5 million views, which I think is funny because people were complaining about, you know, Musk's new Twitter or whatever, because like the for you tab is like very triggering. At least it is for me. Um, but this, I think this is genius. And now like every time someone retweets it, reposts it, and it just and then says something negative like oh bitcoiners are stupid they're not doing the math and it's like actually you're not doing the math this is this is the reality and it gives us a chance to to prove that like literally everything is good for bitcoin like nothing is bad for bitcoin because this really well established entity the new york times uh just blatantly you know screws the pooch on facts and then you have you know thousands of people coming after them uh but then the counterpoint is millions of impressions. And I think that's awesome. It's just like there's the, the famous picture of the guy holding up the buy Bitcoin thing drawn on like a yellow legal pad behind Janet Yellen when she was testifying or something. Yeah. Like it's that level, to me it's that level. So for the rest of my life, that anytime I see a picture of like Pierre in a hard hat with a high vis vest, I'm gonna remember the, the moment that I watched that video and started dying laughing. And all the people that are just like, just engaging with it on a like thinking it's serious like we're actually trying to mansplain it or bitsplain it but it's really just it just shows you how uh the bitcoiners are just not going to tolerate any of this stuff anymore we're out in the open and we're we're i think going on the offense a little bit um which you know i guess you could say is our version of the um you know, the, the Federal Reserve tr and Treasury coming out and having press conferences. At some point, we'll just have our own version of the Jerome Powell, you know, uh, press conference announcing some sort of move. And we're, but it's just going to be highlights for us where we're going to say, oh, you know, hey, we're at a million addresses with one Bitcoin, right? We're at, uh, you know, and we're almost there, right? You said the number was like 9.935 or something, or 993,000. 900, yeah, just under. Just under a million. So we're super close. So some of you people out there that have like half a Bitcoin, you buy another half a Bitcoin <laughs> and then you're going to push this is like a telethon. Here. Yeah. If you're if listening, you're, <laughs> just stack, buy another half a Bitcoin. Stackathon. We prove that there's a million, million people separately holding a one full Bitcoin. That's awesome because that's going to be the... Well, there's know, a caveat I, there because it's not necessarily each person, you know, it could be you have two addresses with one Bitcoin on it, right? So it's not necessarily one to one, but it's a good approximate. It's a good approximate. But yeah. This sits, it, on a, this sits on the point back to mining, like mm -hmm. miners, in order to be on the offensive, they need to stop trying to be on the defense. They need to be uh, super transparent with their data. I know a lot of them have been super like tight lipped about where their data, data centers are, or how much they're paying for electricity. Mm -hmm. it's like look guys that time's over okay you need to you need to get together they have sort of self-regulatory organizations or uh, interest groups whatever you call it mm -hmm. already okay get your data together get your shit together effectively and mm -hmm. have some useful data that people can use instead of just relying on you know long debunked uh we talked about this last time mm -hmm. you know xyz soup du jour data that's out there that's nonsense garbage right enough right. with the estimates like it, yeah give us the hard if, numbers 
if you give us the hard numbers or you produce hard numbers, and I think, you know, one of the only entities that I've seen that really does this is like the Cambridge study. So Cambridge has like a, a, a Bitcoin study effectively that's constantly ongoing. And if you go to their website, there's a link to say, oh, this is what the total energy uses, usage is. And then as a result, if it was this percentage of hydro, this percentage of nuclear, this percentage of coal or wind or whatever, this is how many megatons of carbon would be produced to generate that much electricity. Now, it's like really hard to be specific about that because Bitcoin miners are literally worldwide, right? So the Kazakhstan might have X, Wisconsin might have Y, Florida has Z, Texas has PR squared. Like there's all these different numbers of, of exahashes that are coming from all these other places. But I think what it comes down to is if people don't see value in Bitcoin, then it doesn't matter how, it, like they don't, they don't wanna do the homework. Um, I have a Bitcoin mine in Texas and we had to place a deposit for our energy usage ahead of time. Sometimes it's 20%, sometimes it's 50%. So like, and it's, you sign like a four or five year contract, so it's, or more. So you're committing to buy that power, the power purchase agreement. And let's say I was gonna use like, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of right, like, like a gigawatt or something like that, right? I would have to pay the equivalent of that, which is like, let's say three, four, five cents a uh, kilowatt hour or whatever times, you know, 20% of that gigawatt ahead of time, you know, for, for a couple of years. So I'm going to have to plunk down millions of dollars potentially uh, in electricity deposits, which then allows, and, and then I still have to buy all my own infrastructure and stuff like that. So this is the thing that when, when you talk about baseload calculation, and this is like very in the weeds, but yeah, the reason why Bitcoiners say that Bitcoin mining is good for the grid, super distilled, very simple, because we have to place massive deposits down with the electrical entities in order to get that power. So that money, which then goes to subsidize the production of that power, right? We're, we're, we're making a deposit and a promise to buy that for years and years. So what that does is that allows them to fortify their, their own grid internally. If they do this, maybe they take it and do like stock buybacks or something, but we're effectively purchasing so much of this stuff ahead of time. Like the first year basically is we're, we're buying that out. So they have, they have a chance to reinvest that to produce more power and then drop the prices for everybody around us. And that's, that's what this one particular mining facility did and had to do. Uh, and that's why that particular uh, town, which is a very like, very rural, very out, out in the woods kind of place. That's why they're claiming, and this is what has been backed up, is they're producing income for the community is because they're, they're lowering the electricity costs for people in the community. Now, this Times article says, no, it's the opposite. There's, there's you know, power, power is five or 10% more expensive now. And it's like, well, okay, hang on. Power might be more expensive, the dollar is obviously worth less. There's been massive inflation. Right. Correlation um, is not causation. <laughs> there's been a massive amount of inflation. So is like, is, are any of these power providers going to just flatline and just hold electrical prices steady through that inflation? No, they have to pay wages. They have to buy transformers. They have to buy copper, copper wire ca cabling, all that stuff. So like everything's more expensive. So then it's like, okay, the real math of that would be if you, if you trace CPI, where, what is power cost, what have power costs done in Texas versus CPI, not versus a year ago, like with no other corrective, you know, analysis right, right. And, and CPI, we all agree is like, it's kind of low on the scale of, of low, yeah. accuracy, right? So it's probably, if, if CPI has been at seven, eight, nine, ten percent or whatever it is, then that really means it's probably even 15, 20%. Now, granted, there's like spikes and dips in there for egg prices, wood, uh, you know, rent or gas or something like that. But, but realistically, like we can all agree that from a year ago or three years ago, there's a huge step change to the prices of everything consumer related power, rent, interest rates, everything's way higher than it was a couple of years ago. So just by doing a little bit of high school math, you can just totally reduce the, 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 I would say the efficacy of their argument. You, you can totally neutralize and pop their balloon. And, um, and when you do it in a troll format, it's even better. And, and that's, I think there's two ways of attacking it, but I, I but I, I really like the, the interest rate thing. And I think that's something we talk about all the time. You watch, uh, our boy Jay Powell talk all the time. 
uh, is what they're doing actually working? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of us that have been skeptical of the, of how much manip human manipulation is required to sort of not bork the economy nose down into the mountains. But um, what do you got on that on the recent stuff? Yeah, one last thing I mentioned just today, there was a uh, testimony from some Nebraska public power district talking about how one site was generating 65 million in economic impact, 200 jobs, 5.5 million in tax revenue, uh, and that it was uniquely rural because of the uh, you know mobility of mining. You know, you're not you're not in a city; you're in the middle of nowhere, right? Because that's just maybe where that the best power source is going to be for certain uh, sites. So anyway, it's just another indication that this isn't all just like. Yeah, because you can't doom build and gloom, up... hopium. This is like legitimately happening, you know. Right, and and I would say that like the the thing that a lot of people have a hard time with, especially people that don't find value in Bitcoin, and why Bitcoin's more unique because of the base load and and the the load shedding and all the stuff that it can do. Um, you can turn Bitcoin off from like eleven a.m. to three p.m. You turn your miners off, you know, peak peak heat of the day or whatever you want to call it, right? You could do that if you want. You can't close the Mall of America during that time, right? right? You can't turn off like a normal factory during that time. You cannot do that because that's like no one's going to come and then like take a siesta for three hours in the middle of the day. But Bitcoin can do that for three hours or three days. A, a mining facility, it doesn't matter how big you are, how small you are, you know, that's economic incentive. You've made the deposit. Right now you're getting a tax break effectively is the way I look at it. Like you've already put the, you know, like I said, if we have to make a million dollar deposit on electricity for a certain amount of time, then if they want to give us back twenty five thousand uh, dollars, that's cool. You know what I mean? And and if we take that twenty five thousand dollars and then pay our power bill with it, then it always sort of stays in that bucket and it's always power bill related. You know, and we could turn around and go buy a Bitcoin with it on sale. But then, you know, you might have to sell that Bitcoin to pay your power bill later. So there's like a lot of complex issues that come with running a Bitcoin mine. But the bottom line is how many industries will move to the middle of nowhere to because, you know, with and then, nothing and no one with nothing and, of, and actually produce produce money yeah. for that municipality. Right. And literally revive a dying, you know, we can look at like upstate New York or um, places in Texas, but the Rust Belt, especially like revive mm -hmm. a dying uh, geography. Yeah. Geography. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm right, sensitive so, to that, CJ, because I'm from mid the Midwest. I'm from outside right. of Detroit, basically. So yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, I have I have a lot of family in the Midwest and from the Midwest, and um, like you know, my grandparents were from Ohio. Uh, my grandfather went to like Wisconsin. Um, I have family in Michigan, um, so I know there's a lot of like, you know, let's say economic downside that's happened as manufacturing has moved out of those places, right? right. And that was like the big driver of economic wealth in the Boomer days um you know post world war ii we had a lot of stuff happening in those in those areas because there was physical production but like bitcoin is the physical energy being used and expended which you have to pay money for um but the taxes and everything that these businesses that are operating at that scale these big you know multiple you know, like just I, I there's multiple huge miners across the country it doesn't really matter what name brand you have but they're all paying taxes they're all paying in, they're all paying salaries. They're all contributing in that regard. So it's kind of like not that different than a lot of other businesses that, that have 100 employees or 1,000 employees or whatever. You're, you're providing, like you said, in Nebraska, economic impact, which is like how people get reelected. So I think the politicians- and it can't be this. outsourced either, right? Like it's on site. It is physically, you're physically there. It's not like in India or, uh, you know, anyway, China, whatever. Right, right, right. And, and so the thing that we take, uh, I would say, is a special- uh like like sword to the implications that it's polluting more than any other energy source and because it's not every energy source is doing the same thing it's there's it's producing heat potentially but that's it there's no like co2 production directly because you have a s19 or a what's minor plugged in it's just right. not right. it's not real um but yeah like like so transitioning though um back to rates back to rates and back to federal policy and stuff like that. Um, you know, there was this whole thread that the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett was in Japan and he's making these moves because, you know, we're going to go higher for longer. Um, 
what what's what's the latest from from you know the Federal Reserve and from the U.S. Treasury in that regard? Yes, we had a CPI uh, data point come out on Wednesday. CPI is uh, reported monthly, and it's the inflation breakdown, basically, right? Mm-hmm. Which for most of our lives, me included, like I've never paid attention to CPI, but now it's like every month I know I got to see when CPI because, you know, it's coming down, which is good, but uh, it also affects equities, risks, risk markets, uh, you know, S&P, all that stuff. Um, I'm just looking at, I don't know the screen, but it came down to around 5%, which it was even ahead of expectations. The, the estimate was around 5.2%. Mm-hmm. So it's coming down at a decent clip. The question is, how much more is it going to come down and will rates keep going up? So rates theoretically are just above or could be on the next hike, just above CPI. Mm -hmm. CPI is not the only calculation though. Like any good series of statistics, they have like 25 different versions of it, you know, Mm -hmm. core, super core, uh, blah, 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 right? Um, Right. PCE. So it depends on how you want to break it down. Like if you exclude food and energy, which is the craziest thing to me <laughs> like if you exclude everything people need to live you know that's, uh, that's core core is that but anyway so the question now is are rates high enough is is core coming down fast enough and how do jobs come into all this if you look at the jobs numbers which came out uh friday unemployment was around 3.5 percent again which is super low so they have theoretically they have room to keep raising if they want to but the question is you know, we, they keep talking about soft landing versus no landing versus, uh, you know, hard landing, which nobody wants. That's that's a recession. But mm-hmm. um, they seem to think that they can navigate this smoothly and everything's going to be fine. Um, if you But if you look at the jobs numbers, 25% of those jobs, the increases were services. They're, these mm-hmm. are not jobs that people want the rest of their life. These are not you know, high paying jobs. These are not uh, jobs with insurance necessarily, even, Mm. uh, you know, uh, pension. It's none of that, right? It's, it's, it's the not great jobs. So by counting every job as an equal to another job that that's where they lose me because it's like, okay, I just, I don't see it like that, you know? Right. Well, what's the impact of, of the average job that's growing? What's the, what, you know, and when you have Microsoft, Facebook, Google, maybe even Apple laying off like tens of thousands of people, you know, like those guys all laid off a ton of high paying tech workers all at once. Right. So if you're a tech worker making three or $400,000 a year living in Palo Alto and suddenly you're like sending an application to Applebee's cause you don't know where else to go. Um, that's a problem. Right. And so you might get hired. So that, so that might happen, but that's going to yeah. take some time because yeah. they get, uh, you know, an exit, a golden parachute effectively. Right. They get a bone, uh, not a bonus, but they get a severance. They get a severance. Yeah, well, or they so, have stock to sell, right? Yeah. So I mean, th- yes, they they might have theoretically liquidity right now. Mm, yeah. There might be less uh, paddock watches and less Ferraris and Lambos being bought by those people during right. the summer, right? Until they catch back on. But obviously, Reddit has all these screenshots of like, oh man, I was making five hundred grand a year. I just bought this house. I don't know what I'm gonna do. You know, I just got fired. Da, 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 da. There was a story about a guy who knows if it's real, obviously, but he was saying his mortgage was eight and a half grand a month. <laughs> yeah. And he ended up renting it out for 10. But, uh, you know, again, I don't know if that's real. Just, well, I mean, that che- mathematically, that, mathematically, that checks out. I mean, yeah, you can be like you can have an eight or ten thousand dollar mortgage. It's just if you have a two or three million dollar house, that's what it's that's what it's going to end up being. Um, I, I try to visualize this. I, I try to th- use like real world examples. So I think people can understand it when, when you, someone asks you, well, how would raising rates create a softer landing? So my new visual for that is imagine the plane has totally run out of gas, right? And it's in a descent. <laughs> it's at a controlled descent. There's a way to we like, gotta keep the speed up though. Right. Or else we just crash it. Right. So at some point, if at some point the plane is going to plummet, right? Yeah. If it doesn't have any forward motion. So in, you know, like a 737 or something like that, typically you need to be going about 140, 150 miles an hour uh, knots uh, in order to actually, um, you know, airspeed to, to, for the, for the wing 
or the Venturi effect over the wing to carry the, you know, create lift or whatever. So anything less than that, and you're going to be dropping, like you could stall and then you would like drop straight down. Uh, So a stall is what happens when like, let's say all the, all the customer or consumer confidence rushes out of an entity, then you have a collapse of that particular industry or that bank or whatever. And if that happens in the stock market, like if suddenly everyone just market, market sells all of their equities to get their money into a cash account as opposed to a stock, then if they market sold, if the whole world market sold, then there'd be no bidders and the price could theoretically go to zero for pretty much any anything on the stock stock market, right? Um, so that would be a, a, a full you know stall and drop. But what Powell is trying to do is effectively raise the runway so it can meet the plane somewhere along the descent, right? So if we if they keep cranking away at the at the interest rates and they can keep raising the drawbridge effect of the of the runway, then the runway can catch the plane before the plane hits the ground, right? And then then lower the plane all at once. And then effectively it's a gargantuan task. How much energy has to go into engineering that? How far out do you have to be to build a ramp? you know, to 5%, 6%, whatever it is, but that's really what we're looking at. And that's why they say there's a terminal rate, right? Like how high can we possibly go and then hold it there? And the determining factor of that is obviously what that does to the debt cost for the country, right? Um, Because the country at that point is borrowing money to pay back, you know, and then it's just, it's, it's such a wacky ratio because the debt is over $30 trillion. Well, the shark's got to keep swimming or it's just debt. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I think if people think about it like that, so what, what Powell's trying to do is effectively raise the, the angle of the runway and, and, and they're like underneath the plane driving the runway, you know what I mean? Like trying to like land it. And I think that's that. So they're trying to raise the height of that to, to slow the economy down slow enough because if they slow it down too fast, then like it falls out of the sky and then consumer confidence just goes panic mode. Everybody yanks the, 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 the wheels out from, from the whole operation. Um, so I think in that case, it's a binary thing. Is it working? You know, if We're inflation- looking at using your travel, your, your plane metaphor, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've been traveling lately at all, but I did a little bit of traveling. Airports are full. Restaurants seem to be full. Everybody's hiring, but right. restaurants are full. You know, people mm-hmm. are spending money, at least uh, in the higher, higher tiers of, of yeah. you know, uh, I, so it looks like that's accurate. Got, it looks like we're, we're fine so far, you know? R- right. And I think there's a lot of doom and gloom that's inherent to like when it's your first cycle and you're of consciousness. So your first time really being macro aware of everything, uh-huh. you're like, wow, this is terrible. Everything's going to fall apart. And then you realize, wow, these people have some really big levers at the Fed that they can yank some really big levers in Congress that they can yank some really big, you know, opportunities to manipulate things. And granted, it's a full on manipulation. It's a hundred percent being manipulated, but it's being manipulated with a purpose intentionally by people that are like, I guess you could say doing their best. We can talk all we want as Bitcoiners about how Janet Yellen just has zero idea what she's doing, but the reality is they are working at it to lift that runway up. Now there's a very, you know, there's a particular amount of time, if they don't do it by a certain period of time, then yes, everything is going to fall apart. Whether that's the, the the truck yanking the runway down, like that runs out of gas, they can't, they can't hike it forever, um, or just additional bad things happen that are sort of unforeseen. Um, and then it's money printer go burr all over again, right? But the, because um, that's the only way to save, you just have to print a mountain of cash for the plane to land on. Yeah, you know that's the and only that's, way you can make the low, and that's and, dangerous because they've well, already Paul done has, that. But he's already said, like, look, we'd rather over tighten than under tighten. Mm-hmm. Um, so if that's what needs to be done, that's what they're going to do. But that's right. just the predetermined, right? Know, that's how it's going to be. Yeah, because they could effectively launch the plane again with a lot of fuel from uh, enough quantitative easing once they stop the descent, right? But is 4% the new 2% target? Like, is that where we're going to get? Because CPI now has gone from like, it, it was the, what was the peak? Like 8 or 9%, something like that almost? Yeah. Right? So yeah. now we're down into the 5 range? Okay, so the, so effectively what they're doing has worked to that point. So it's decelerated. Uh, it's, I guess, slower growth, right? Uh, slower cost increases. But if they get it to 4%, do you think that's where they that's where they stop? Or where do you think... Where do you think they freeze 
rates for a while. Cause I think in my head, it makes more sense to have three and a half percent or 4% be the new 2% target that they have. Cause then they still have room to go down without going to zero. Cause if you're at two, like zero is very close and zero is bad. A zero creates all sorts of additional problems, which is how we got here was we were basically at zero for, you know, 15 years or something like that. Yeah. Well, before SVB, they wanted like <clears throat> six, 7% rates and then stuff started like, you know, the plane started to creak a little bit. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so they, they've dialed it back down that rhetoric a little bit, even though they're yeah. like, you know, even if that's, this happens more, we'll just keep throwing cash at it. Right. That's their solution. Um, so higher for longer might just mean, you know, five and a quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, on rates for mm -hmm. the next six months, right? If we look at, we can look at the rate probabilities, which are like the market traded expectations of where we, people think rates are going to go. And that's about in line with the probabilities. The probabilities are super optimistic that rates are actually going to come down quite a bit towards the end of the year. But um, we could just stay, you know, at five and a quarter for six months. And that may be enough to keep hammering inflation lower, lower, lower. The problem with a target above 2% is then all of a sudden you're hurting savers, you're hurting uh, people who aren't making those wage gains, the wage growth to compensate. Mm -hmm. So if if three and a half is the new target on inflation, um, then you know your wages need to be going up three and a half percent every year. Just yeah. like that's what it's that's what it has to be, or else you're you're just losing money, right? You're getting diluted, you're mm -hmm. however you want to think about that. Um that's the that's the issue with with all of this fundamentally we all have to work really hard for our money someone else has, can has the ability to push a button and make money for the for you know like through a program and and that's where that's that's the maximalist argument against the dollar or some of these other like let's say other tokens I, you know i don't have to like say anything negative about anything else but because there's a scarcity in bitcoin you know you run like you you take a lot of uh, potential problems off the table, right? Because you know exactly what the issue and schedule is. In a way, you can kind of calculate based on how many blocks, like when the next halving is going to be. You know, but, like, sure. way, way Definitely. ahead of time. Yeah. So um, we can we can theoretically schedule like the next all the halvings. You know, <laughs> like right. we right. know exactly when about they're going to be. So what we don't know though is what the responses from the fiat industry, the IMF, and the Bank of International Settlements and all that stuff. So uh, Christine Lagarde is in America right now having meetings probably with, you know, Janet and Jerome. Who is Christine people. For, for those unaware? Sorry, Christine Lagarde is the head or president of the IMF the, okay. uh, the, or the ECB. I can't remember if it's one of the other. I think it's a European Central Bank, right? I, I think it's ECB, yeah. Yeah, so the European Central Bank is basically uh, the governor for all things money supply related and interest rates related in Europe. And they basically determine fiscal policy for every country that's in the EU, which is a lot of people, you know? I mean, I don't know if it's a billion people or like 2 billion people, but it's a lot of people. Um, she's here to talk about CBDCs. That's now a big thing. Um, in the past, she's been very dismissive about Bitcoin. A lot of people have. Uh, in Warren Buffett's article or interview, he was actually talking about Bitcoin. He was like, you know, in the sense that he's probably always going to hate it, you know, but he's always going to be forced to talk about it. And I think that just in the in the, the the common consciousness that everybody has, the general intelligence of the population, people are becoming more aware that Bitcoin is a thing. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Been, I mean, every 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 time I hear it on Bloomberg to this day, I turn mm -hmm. like. Did they just say Bitcoin? <laughs> like, I'm, yeah. so, I'm so, I'm so excited when I hear it, and so uh, just not used to it still. But it is; it's everywhere. It people talk about it all the time. There's a great meme <laughs> that was like uh, from Pirates of the Caribbean, where um, you know it's like the New York Times, ECB, mm. yeah, the Fed is like, but you, you, know, but you have heard of me. <laughs> they're yeah. like, this is the worst digital currency we've ever heard of. But you know, but we have heard of you, of course. Yeah. So um, anyway. So, yeah, so I guess it, it's funny because we're, you know, people that are like climate uh, change, uh, you know, let's say climate change alarmists or whatever versus climate change uh, sort of, I don't want to say deniers, but people that are sort of like think there's people that think climate change is a scam. People that think climate change is, is, is the worst terror, worst thing that could ever happen to us. Um, those people, uh, you know, are very critical of the, the sort of tourism 
of these these conferences and stuff like that, right? So you think about the footprint of Davos, how everyone's taking private jets, and then you got Greta Thunberg talking about, oh, you know, cars are evil, and you know we shouldn't use gasoline. And it's like, okay, all these Gulf streams just flew to freaking Switzerland or whatever. Well, another rebuttal to this New York Times thing to bring it all the way back was a picture of the New York Times facility where they print the papers. <laughs> they have like this huge footprint. They have ink. They have chemicals, right? Um, right. And it's like, yeah, like. Let's let's check. You know what's the, the expression? Uh, get well, your own like, house in order before you go after somebody else or whatever. Right, because you have the change the code thing saying, "Oh, Bitcoin needs to go to proof of stake." Right, and now people are criticizing the New York Times, like, "Just go digital only, man. Just go digital only. Look at all the resources you're consuming. How many trees you're cutting down? All the paper. trucks, all the diesel yes. that, that yes. like move everything around. It's like it's really genius because it's almost like this funny martial arts thing of taking their own like attempt at a punch. And like turning it around and then all of a sudden they're punching themselves in the face, you know? Well, if they were genuine, they they would say, yeah, like, look, this is a problem for us and we're going to fix it. But they they just want to come after us. Yeah. Um, so like I was going to say, though, so it is it is there's a sort of touristic effect, like, you know, Biden goes to Ireland or something like that. Lagarde yeah, comes to Ireland, America. Yeah. Right. All that stuff. Um, you know, there's Bitcoin conferences all over the place. Uh, you know, Constantly. I've. I'm yeah, like surprised constant. where these places are like, like right. why? <laughs> so Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador, there's Bitcoin Lake in Guatemala, there's um there's a uh there's Lugano, I guess it is in Switzerland. And um I'm trying to think of some other Bitcoin places, you know, that there's like actual like let's say tourism. But then conference tourism, it's its own thing. It's like, oh, everyone's gonna go to Miami for the conference. Are they going to go to Texas for Bitblock Boom? Are they going to go to, um, you know, uh, the West Coast for the the Pacific Bitcoin or something like that? Um, are you like, are you like, what was the first Bitcoin conference you went to, and what was it like? Well, like, were you sketched out about going to a Bitcoin conference or a crypto conference or a blockchain conference or anything like that back in the day? No, I think I went to I went to meetups a lot, super super early on. Like we're talking mm -hmm. like 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. So like that didn't worry me. Um, I'm trying to think of what was the first one. It might have been consensus in like 2017. That might have been the first one. Um, but I think... a lot of these people I talk to online, I talk to more than my own family. So it's like, you know, I know I know a lot of people in the, the digital world extremely well. Um, right. So well, it's, it if, if if you align ethically with someone, it's very it's it's easier sometimes to yeah. get along with them versus if you just only align genetically, right? So yeah. that's the that's the funny thing. <laughs> um, I've been to a couple of the conferences. I've been as far as I think I went to like a like a one in London in 2019 or something like that, and uh, I was kind of let down by the the content of that particular thing. I, I've met some interesting people over the years going to these different ones. I went to Consensus last year. Uh, we had like a little panel uh, for our, our, our book. Um, we um, we did, uh, but like the weirdest, most amazing thing that blew my mind that I ever heard was at the LA Blockchain Summit. This is like five years ago or something. And uh, Tim Draper can, comes on stage with his crazy eyebrows and he goes, you know, in the future, the, the, the people that have Bitcoin are going to be so wealthy that governments will compete for them as citizens. And I was like, that's the most mind blowing thing I've ever heard. And then uh, I, I kind of dug into it a little bit, but he was talking about the sovereign individual as a book and sort of the thesis behind that, which is basically that if you can work remotely, work digitally, you can live anywhere. So you're going to live where it's best for you. Low taxes, good health care, low crime, stuff like that. Um, basically explaining not tourism, but sort of migration, you know, in a way that if you have a, a strong enough digital currency, you can do that. So I, I think like Bitcoiners like to go to places like Miami because it's fun and it's the summertime and, you know, all that stuff. But you get to a point, I think, in Bitcoin where you you like excited to go to all the meetups, all the conferences, and then you're like, oh, we're just talking about the same stuff. I don't have to go to that. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, something else is happening and you want to go um it was like i think last year like jordan peterson was in miami so it was like oh wow this guy's who's like a a really big like uh social commentator right now suddenly is talking about bitcoin and i don't know i i i wonder kind of who the next wave of i hate i hate the word influencer but like outsiders are going to come to bitcoin and then make that interesting you know for for bitcoin people but it's like i think because of all these things with the new york times piece or you know, Fed now or any of these other things, these people are like 
prairie dogging a little bit. I'm like, what? Wait, they're going to take my more of my freedoms away? I don't want that. And then like, oh, Bitcoin censorship resistant? Like, I need to learn about that. So I, I've seen like these conferences and people are like, oh, you're going to go to like Ghana for this conference? Are you going to go to like Oslo for this? Are you going to go to, you know, and I'm like, okay, like the travel thing for conferences, I see all the same people. So it's like, yeah. unless I'm going to see new people, I'm not really sure. But I don't, and I don't know. And plus you're plugged in. Like for people who aren't plugged in, I can see how it's super valuable education, you know, meeting people, understanding what's going on in the industry. If you don't see it day to day, like it's not, if it's not literally your job and your life, you know, like it's mm -hmm. a little different because right. you're right. I go to like hang out with people in real life, not necessarily to like, you know, talk about Bitcoin. Right. Right. Because that's all I do. Right. So the the fun thing for me that I'm looking forward to this summer, though, is um, I'm going to be out in D.C. a bunch to uh, to talk to some of the offices, the Congress and Senate offices. We, like during election season, we can't really mess with anybody. We can't talk to them because they're obviously they're busy just trying to get reelected. But now that everyone's sort of like comfortably in their seats for the next couple of years, um, it's going to be very interesting to see with all these other world events happening, how the tone has changed since you know last summer, last fall when we were out there or the year before that. Uh, when the infrastructure bill was going on. So over the last couple of years, like I would say the, the sort of connection between people being macro aware of interest rates and Bitcoin as like this sort of punk rock thing, cypherpunk thing, um, kept a lot of people out of the political sphere and kept people away from that. But now when you have, you know, Jerome Powell on TV all the time and Yellen on TV all the time, I think people are sort of seeing that there's a value in, um, I'm trying to think of what I would say. There's well, when a, rates are zero, you're like, yeah, the Fed, whatever, who cares, right? Yeah. But all of a sudden, when they're they're affecting your life directly, you're like, okay, right. like what are, what what are they saying? Like, I need to know what they're saying. I need to know what they mean, right? It's yeah. And if, if if everything feels safe and you're just like throttle down, number go up on all of your investments, your house is more valuable, your stock portfolio is more valuable. Uh, you know, you got some crazy two percent deal that you're paying interest only, and like everything's cheap. When everything's cheap and all the stuff, all of your assets are up, like there's like you, it's like there's nothing to worry about, nothing you're concerned with. And I think that's the difference between America and a lot of these other third world countries that have had these monster currency events, whether it's Lebanon or Argentina or whatever. These are like, I mean, Argentina is a really big country, right? And and you know they like won the World Cup. They've got celebrities from there. They've got a whole. I mean, I'm a big fan of Argentinian uh, beef and steakhouses and whatnot. So there's like it's it's in the it's it's one of the bigger countries in South America. When they have a hundred percent inflation, right, year over year, it's bad. And people in Argentina need things like Bitcoin because their wages and their contracts and stuff like that are effectively not worth anything. If you sign a five year deal, you know, to play soccer for some Argentinian team, like your salary is locked in. They're not going to give you a raise. So by the fifth year, if inflation is doing this, you're basically making a, a, a tenth of what you were making your first year or worse. Um, that sucks. And people do have to deal with that in these worst places. And that's where I think there's the, the, the Bitcoin advocacy thing. You know, there's no other thing out there that's like, hey, bring us your broken money, change it for this really good money. <laughs> You know what I mean? Bring us yeah. your time and your work and get paid in this good money, this hard money, this scarce money. Um, it's really compelling. And I think at some point it'll be so cheap to live in some of these other places. If you are a Bitcoiner, you know, like Bitcoin hit 40,000 Canadian the other day. Right. That's a pretty big thing, considering, you know, obviously it was probably 20,000 Canadian or something a couple a couple months ago. So mm -hmm. I, I just I think there's like it, with with Trudeau's president, it's probably hard for freedom seeking Bitcoiners to like, oh, I'll move to Canada because it's like cheaper to live there or something because I don't think it is. But you know, at some point it makes sense to move to one of these places and be like the mayor or the, <laughs> you know, like the big shot with the big house and the big, and, you know, the big gate and the big dogs and the big pool, right? It makes sense to, to move at some point if it's so much more, if the quality of life can go up because you have more spending power. And I, I, I think we're, we're seeing more countries default on debt, beg for from the I, for the IMF for for rescues and stuff like that. And I, I do think that if Bitcoin goes back on a bull run or, or keeps the run that it's on right now, that the sustained like, you know, week over week growth or whatever, um, you could see some people packing up and leaving America if they don't like the politics of that state that they're in and moving to a new country, not just a new state, not just like moving to Texas or Florida 
or, or Tennessee or something like that, but literally moving to like, I don't know, uh, get buying a castle in, in, in one of these other places. And well, I, the I guess the regulatory environment is as harsh or continues to be as harsh as it is for a lot of these like crypto businesses, crypto people, crypto investors, hundred percent. Right. You're just, you're just like, okay, I'm voting with my feet. I'm out. Right. That's yeah. it. That's enough. And, and, and that's where, um, that's where I think America has a chance to, to screw it up and drop the ball is if they, if they effectively make it a, too harsh and they make mining a bad business to be in, in America, then you'll, you know, you've already, you've already invested all this money in the infrastructure. You can pack your transformers and your ASICs up and your containers up and ship them somewhere else and go do it somewhere else. Cause you know, you're in it for the money in that regard. Right? It already happened out of China, right? It came from China to here. So like it's, it could happen again. Anywhere. Yeah, exactly. And if Mexico suddenly says, you know what? Hey, like we're going to build a nuclear plant, bring your Bitcoin mines down here. Or El Salvador says, Hey, we've got the volcano cranking out now. We can, we can support, <laughs> you know, this many exahashes or terahashes or whatever it is. Um, and at this price, you're like, but I like beaches. I like pupusas. Like I'll hang out like the, Bukele took all the murderers off the street and put them all in jail. Like, that's cool, you know. And then you, you see the the Max Kaiser and Stacy effect of of celebrity type people in the space moving down there and being sort of first movers. Um, but then from there, you could see like vacation destinations popping up. But there's just like this effect that, that things roll because if the Bitcoiners are spending their Bitcoin locally, then those local merchants are then participating in the economy, and it does, you know. It does recycle or, or stay frothy enough to, to attract more business. And I that's to me, that is like a circular like a, economy. That's the dream. That's a, that's the dream. That's the, that's the thing we're all kind of aiming at saying, hey, are we five years away from that? Are we six years? Are we 12 years, 15 years? But we, I think a lot of people concur that once Bitcoin monetizes to a certain level, then each sat is worth a certain amount of money. And then when you look at it, what's the sat worth or how many dollars do you, you know, does it cost for however many sats, then that's really where you, that's when you're going to see people just getting up and going because if they're going to be fed up and then it's very easy as a Bitcoin wealthy person to just, okay, got my ledger, you know, got my account. I'm good. I don't need Bank of America. I don't need uh, Wells Fargo. I don't need any of these, like, you know, I don't need Silicon Valley bank, right? They can just go somewhere. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out what that price point is for, for the people that are in it. Cause there's, you know, almost a million, pe- almost a million addresses with one Bitcoin. So that's the fact that's enough of a majority in a, in a third world country, you know what I mean? To represent a pretty big class. And if imagine somebody like, like Bukele invites half of those people, a quarter of those people or 20% of those people buy, end up buying a house in El Salvador or building houses in El Salvador. All of a sudden, like you have a huge wealthy class that's now El Salvadorian, um, and I don't know if they have red passports or whatever color that is, but you know, effectively, the, that's that's how it could play out, and we're not that far away from that. From a, I think, a price standpoint, if Bitcoin goes to like a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand, which is let's call it seven x from where it is, two hundred ten thousand or something, like that's a pretty significant increase in wealth for some of these people. And I'm assuming you can buy a house in El Salvador for 100,000 American dollars, right? So effectively half a Bitcoin at that point. I haven't um, checked the El Salvadorian Zillow, but I'll get yeah. back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a Zillow, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's, and, and maybe that's where we wrap up. But I just think yeah. that like as Bitcoin sort of tr- like transcends disbelief, to enough people and there's enough people stacking sats routinely and we see that address counter on Glassnode or whatever go from 0. 0.01 how many people have bitcoin to 0. 0.1 bitcoin to 1.0 bitcoin and like you see the mobility from each of those steps and going from let's say $300 worth to $3000 worth of of you know someone holding that you know it, it gets tempting to think about the oh I could just sell it all you know or not sell it all I could sell all my other stuff how dare you how dare you um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I said that in the wrong sequence. I could sell all my other stuff and buy Bitcoin okay, with that, I sell my that kids. money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not the kids. Keep the kids. Kids are a great resource. Uh, they're cheap labor until they're until they're at least fifteen. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so you sell all your stuff. You know, sell your house if you could monetize all that into Bitcoin. Go to wherever you want to go. Show up at a new place. 
with a big, big ability to spend in that place. And if you have a skill set that allows you to work remotely from that point, man, like that's got to be tempting. You got it's, you got it's, it. it's BBE, big Bitcoin yep. energy. Big Bitcoin. Oh, I like that. Big Bitcoin <laughs> energy. There you go. That, that's it. So I think we should right. uh, we should leave it there today. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate your time. As always, folks, this is not financial advice. Do your own research. Don't trust Verify. And uh, if it's not your keys, it's not your coin.